Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be, try to be short because uh, we're running a little bit late and then there is a talk after us. So today we're going to have a talk about, uh, I don't know, alternative energy. Uh, I think it's important. I think uh, if we really want to make a dent in CO2, we need to be looking at some serious stuff as well. And for this purpose, we have today Dr. Uh, Joe Boromedi. And he is a NASA chair professorship. Uh, he held a NASA chair professorship position at the Naval Postgraduate School. He worked at NASA for 10 years as a technology manager, lead systems engineer, nuclear specialist, and propulsion researcher. He's basically a rocket scientist guy. <laughs> Uh, he there managed uh, manage the emerging propulsion technology area for in-space systems, uh, the Marshall Air Launch Team, as well as a variety of other power and propulsion assignments. After earning a doctorate degree in mechanical engineering from University of Alabama in Huntsville, he spent several years as a research scientist and senior research engineer at the UAH Propulsion Research Center, where he served as a principal investigator and manager for the Solar Thermal Laboratory. He has worked as a senior mechanical designer at Pratt & Whitney, supporting aircraft engine manufacturing at and at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory within the Laser Fusion Program. Uh, he's a graduate uh, from the United States uh, Military Academy. I think uh, you'll find out that he knows what he's talking about, and uh, I am eager to hear what he has to say. So please uh, give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great introduction. It's a blessing to be here. Um, I have a lot of material to go over, so I'm going to um, suspense with some of my uh, normal um, comments and jokes and um, go right to it. I plan to be uh, talking about this in context of fusion, um, but I'm going to hold back some comments for there to get through the material and get to the questions. Um, one note in the beginning, I've come here as an individual. Um, I don't represent any agency or organization. There's a loose-fitting group of people around the country, um, mainly... Uh, uh, specialists, technologists, they're interested in this field, uh, both in energy and in particular thorium, and that uh, we all have day jobs, fortunately good paying day jobs for the most part, and uh, so we come to uh, give this information out freely and um, uh, examine this idea and uh, the use of thorium as an energy source. Uh, outline, i um, just going to mention that I, I talk about systems engineering because I've taught that as well as my thermodynamics and, and nuclear background. You'll see a little bit of that. Uh, some assumptions, I'm assuming that most people understand the energy crisis. It's global in nature. It's, uh, nobody's got a quick fix, at least nobody who agrees what the quick fix is. Um, thorium is not going to be commonly known, especially as an energy source. Uh, increased electrical capacity is very important to the overall energy consumption. And the last thing is um, energy equates to the state uh, or the standard of living. And one of the last green energy forums I was at uh, listening to, they uh, equated to 58 slaves, if you will, working full time at hard labor, 365 days a year uh, for each person in the United States. And you can see that that level of energy is what gives us the standard of living. This slide comes from Lawrence Livermore Laboratories. It's uh, one that I would spend a long time on. I think it has a lot of great points to be made. Um, I would just say that if you don't know what a quad is, 10 to the ninth uh, BTUs, uh, it's a lot of energy. And if you just take all the energy we have in the United States and break it up into 100, um, you get 100%. So you can see uh, oil is around 40%, and that line is the, the thickness uh, equivalent to that. So you can see that most people would say, we want to increase these desirables, okay? And notice the desirables are, are pretty thin, um, and it's kind of hard to increase them. These are the ones we probably want to phase out more, as well as less oil. Um, <clears throat> we have huge energy losses in electricity production, about 25% efficient overall. Conservation is great. Um, do it at home. Most engineers, if they don't have to... Uh, create any uh, entropy, increase entropy in the uh, universe. They would like to uh, minimize that. Um, but at the same token, you can see that we've paid the price up here and that um, conservation, as much as we want to, um, there's not a whole lot of gains there um, in these two areas. 
The other thing is, if you notice right here, um, you can't make that line go to zero. Thermodynamics says you always have to have a, a cold sink. You always have to move energy. Um, one example I talk about is uh, wind, that you can put up a windmill and you can put another windmill behind it and you can extract a little more energy and slow that air down. But there's a, a fundamental limit. If you put too many of them in there, you not only get the last one to not move because there's no airflow, okay, you've actually affected all the windmills in front of it until you get no energy. So there's a fundamental limits to, to uh, thermodynamics. You always have to have some loss there. And of course, most people would consider that you want to um, increase the, uh, the electricity flow into uh, cars or transportation areas as well. So what you really want to do is, if you can't grow these things fast enough on the, the order of this size, you really want some new energy source, something big, something uh, um, you know, that comes in, can be readily built, um, and provide that, that very big, wide line. Something like fusion, right? Everybody would like to see that. Well, I'm here to talk about thorium and whether thorium can be that line. And also, what's the best way to extract that energy? Now, without getting to a lot of details, you can take a little bit of thorium, put it in a normal reactor, and you get some benefits out of it. Okay? But it's not an end all, and it, it doesn't extract all the energy out of that, that uh, thorium that you'd like to. And it doesn't mitigate all the problems you have with today's nuclear power. Thorium, just for background, is an element. Uh, 1828 was discovered. It is slightly radioactive. Uh, got a very long half-life. That's why it's around. Um, and it provides uh, um, a, your background radiation along with uranium. Uh, most of it comes from that, uh, just a little bit of thorium that's always around in, in the uh, soil and in uh, rocks and minerals. The only thing I'm going to say here is that thorium is not really commercially used for, for anything of much these days. Um, it is a metal. Uh, it's got a, a very wide liquid range, some other interesting properties. Um, I'm not going to go into any other details to know that commercially it's not a, a big deal. Now, this is a log scale of what's available in the Earth's crust. And you see that at the beginning, you have oxygen, silicon, aluminum um, down here at 100 parts per million. Um, in this box here, you have copper in the middle. And towards the bottom, you got lead and thorium. And you can see I expanded this little area out. Uranium is about four times less than, than uh, thorium. Boron, which uh, some talks have, uh, uh, even at Google, have talked about fusion using boron. All right, it's there. It's uh, readily available. But what's interesting is the uranium that you're really interested, the one fissile material, actually uh, split, is way down here, orders of magnitude less. So thorium, on a theory, a theoretical basis, the um, United States has about 20% of the world's reserves. Uh, to put this in perspective, one would say if you replaced all the energy, electrical energy generation in the United States uh, that you saw before, and I'm not suggesting we do that. Um, a lot of other energy sources will play. But that's about 400 metric tons. Uh, one mine can produce about 40, 500 metric tons per year. Uh, you can see that's 10 times the amount. Um, the United States has actually, uh, the government has buried a bunch of thorium. They didn't know what to do with it. Uh, after paying for it and, and storing it, they just uh, put it in the ground, literally, in these casts. You can imagine that's uh, even at this, this huge amount of uh, energy usage, uh, that lasts uh, eight to 10 years. Uh, in a practical sense, this would last us uh, uh, probably 25 to 50 years. Um, and uh, you certainly have plenty of thorium available around the world. That's not enough. Like fusion, we can go to the moon. The difference is there, we don't have to mine the entire surface looking for it. Uh, thorium gives a nice signal, um, and you can detect that from space, and so we can map it. And where the hot spots are, you know that there's a pretty good thorium uh, uh, deposit there. Same with Mars. So uh, we know it's out there in the asteroids, um, thousands of years worth of, uh, of power. Now, because of my systems engineering background, a little bit of the flavor I'm going to give you is um, in the vein of, of how do you select things or, or systems engineering uh, criteria. And this comes from the aerospace, that uh, about 80% of a project's life uh, costs and benefits are going to be locked in the first initial uh, decisions you make. And that, that pretty much, uh, for all technologies, especially high tech, tech technologies, that holds pretty well true, 70, 90%, somewhere in there. Um, and the reason is it sets your theoretical limits. It also, at the time, you have your least real world knowledge of how you're going to build or how you're going to go about doing this project. So you, 
the thing I try to teach is you look for the inherent barrenness, something untouchable, uh, at least tr reasonably untouchable in a growth factor that um, uh, your concept will, will gain uh, and exceed what your goals are. So let's take nuclear technology as we see it today. You know, list the pros and cons that I've shown here. Most people recently have looked at, you know, no greenhouse em emissions, and that's because uh, in this case, uh, about a third comes from electricity, and the far majority of that is coal. Um, nuclear doesn't have that. Now, to be very honest, one would have to and analyze, well, how much resources does all this make when I go to build a plant, and how much CO2 do I produce? In the case of a nuclear energy, there is some, but over the lifetime and the amount of energy a nuclear plant produces, uh, this is probably pretty a fair game to say it produces no CO2. But it's something you need to be honest about and, and compare. Um, what if you could take some of the cons out of there, the safety fears and um, uh, long-term sustainability and uh, uh, terrorist or proliferation issues and make them go away or at least minimize them? Sounds like what Fusion wants. Another thing on systems engineering is the is concept of power density and efficiency. I uh, can't go through all these, but obviously land usage, um, you know, the maintenance costs, anything that you have to deal with, the overall cost of the lifetime of the project, um, smaller is not just convenient. It drives 90% of the time, it drives the cost. And therefore, at least the social cost, uh, maybe not in a particular um, market, uh, but across the board it usually does. And you'll see that that's very important for um, power density and efficiency. An example uh, that comes into mind um, is uh, the cost of material labor and then the distance from the end user and all these other factors that factor in. Um, I'm not going to go into big detail. This is you know, uh, information that's available and, and readily been talked about. Um, natural gas uh, turbine engines um, is uh, about one tenth the uh, amount of steel, for example, in a nuclear plant. And a nuclear plant is actually pretty good compared to some of the others. Uh, but you see that in recent years, what are we building? We're building these very, um, very expensive, uh, difficult, um, gas-using um, machines that are pretty high-tech, yet we're building more of those. Why? Well, because overall, the resources necessary to produce that and to meet the demand now um, makes you go for these things, and that's, what, that's what's been happening. So um, in the light of the, what Fusion wanted to be, safe, proliferation resistance, et cetera, um, that was one of the jokes. Um, today we have basically large plants, although there were a couple of uh, Google talks that uh, talking about making Fusion in a way that's smaller. I, I would love that to happen. Um, but basically we've got these very large plants, and of course they use a lot of, they produce a lot of energy, but they also absorb a lot of energy in producing the energy. So your net gain is, is uh, not as good as you would want. Kind of get into the history as well as the physics at the same time and talk you through a little bit about uh, thorium and why we ended up with the, the lifter concept. Three basic uh, nuclear fuels. Everybody should know, you know, uranium-235 is what's naturally found. That's what we can start with. These two have to come from fertile material. We have to make them. They're not found in nature. And in history, everybody was working on weapons. And so you have an enrichment facility. You need a weapon design. You need fabrication techniques. For the uranium-238, you need a neutron source, which also usually starts with the uranium-235. You chemical separate. You need a new weapon design, new fabrication techniques. You get a slightly better bomb. That's all I will say on that. And thorium, well, they discovered you need the same thing you need with the uh, uranium-238, chemical separation, but then there's some contaminant in this, usually, in which you go to an enrichment facility, but it's a hot enrichment facility. You need yet a new weapon design and new fabrication techniques to get the same kind of bomb. Well, obviously, these two are what um, the world has chosen to, to work on. Well, at the same time, most of the people that worked on those projects uh, also were good people trying to say, what, what good can we do besides weapons? Uh, and elect electricity production was one of them early on. And they had the same problem. They had the same materials to start with. You need enrichment or heavy water production, a, new, a fuel design, okay, a little bit different, uh, but it's still solid fuel, fabrication, and then electrical power. I say short-term electrical power because 
At the time, they really underestimated how much uranium-235 was in the world. It was a little bit more than, than they actually uh, were accounting for originally. But at world usage, at the U.S. levels, uh, it's still a, a very true statement to say, you know, there will be peak uranium if you, if you base everything on, on uranium-235. Well, you can go with breeders. Um, fast spectrum breeder reactor. You need some sophisticated controls. We'll talk about that in a little bit more. Uh, uh, some fuel design, and uh, you get electrical power. But you also get a whole lot more production of plutonium, which can use for nuclear uh, power and run other reactors to produce electricity. Or, of course, you can use that for weapons. Thorium, on the other hand, looks a little different each time. Thermal spectrum, chemical processing, and you get electrical power. Very hard to get any extra out of it. And I'll explain that here. Um, Enrico Fermi uh, argued for the plutonium-based economy, essentially. And one of the reasons is you get three neutrons on average per fission. And um, the real key number you want to look at is this blue line. And that is the number of neutrons that come per absorption. And you need at least two. You need one to split and one to breed your next fuel. And so uh, in reality, you need a little bit more than that because uh, losses through the reactor um, got to make it reasonable. So you have to work this thing. It doesn't work here at all in the thermal spectrum. You have to work up here in the uh, um, near the what I call the bomb spectrum, OK? You're, you're using the, the fast neutrons coming off, off the, uh, the reactor from the fissions. You're not slowing them down in a, thermal, in a thermal sense. And you can see that this number really climbs very good, which means you get uh, a whole lot more than two, which means you get production of, of uh, plutonium, or you can use it for production of plutonium. Well, Eugene Wigner at the time argued, well, you know, it's great for weapons, but we really want to base our economy on thorium. It's more available and more important. It runs on the neutron spectrum, the thermal spectrum, such that um, it's a lot safer, a lot easier to control. You uh, can uh, you know, use these reactors. This is a very difficult reactor, a very touchy reactor to work. Um, but of course, it doesn't produce much because you see the average from the fission is only two and a half. And the actual absorption averages a little bit below that, OK? So you're above two, which is enough. But with real real losses, you're not going to breed a whole lot of extra uh, material out of, this, out of this system. Well, historically, what did we do? We went from weapons to the Nautilus. Um, there was uh, Eisenhower's um, uh, Atoms for Peace program, which was trying to say, well, we spent all this money. We want to look a little bit better in the eyes of the world. Let's produce electricity. Um, but you're using the same infrastructure, the same people, the same needs and desires. You pour it into here. Uh, to, at, at shipping port was our first uh, electrical plant. And sure enough, that is the base product for um, our surface ships. So a little bit of entangled there. It wasn't exactly atoms for peace in a uh, conventional sense of what's the best way to produce um, electricity. Well, is that a good or bad decision? Well, I'm not sure I want to sit here and debate that. but. You know, at the time, urgency of war, the fact that the uh, weapons were un unsophisticated designs, you needed a lot of material for it. The delivery systems were horrible, OK? And uh, so you needed a large number to be a credible defense. Um, safety, environment, those kinds of things weren't considered uh, as much. Compared to today, obviously, with very efficient designs, ICBMs are highly accurate. Um, the need to scale down. We almost have too much material for weapons. And of course, safety, environment, proliferation issues are the big concerns. Maybe it was right then, maybe wrong today. People can decide that. Well, in the tale of um, the nuclear reactor, uh, thorium, uh, engineers don't want to give up. Uh, when they see a good idea, they dog it, even though programmatically and the money and the funding was completely cut off. Um, they went around, they said, look, um, Air Force, you don't, you don't have ICBMs yet. Um, you need a credible defense uh, to get your weapons out there, something that could fly a long time. How about this nuclear airplane? Now, the only way that this would ever do in a normal reactor is if you had a liquid reactor. Um, and so they started uh, a program. They sold the Air Force on it, as crazy as it is. And I understand that uh, somebody recently has uh, said something in um, uh, England, I believe, about this. Um, I would not like to see uh, nuclear airplanes um, as our base of commercial uh, flight. Um, I can talk about that at some other time for the reasons for that. But this reactor program started out, they did um, 100 hours, a high temperature. I believe that may be the, the, uh, still a, um, a record, uh, certainly for the overall reactor uh, running that long, that hot. 
and uh, that's uh, 1,500 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, very much hotter than, than most reactors can run. Two things that came out of this, one, the fission products were naturally removed as you were pumping at it, which was really nice, and get rid of the poisons. Um, and two, the load following capability, which was essential for the airplane application, and the fact that you wanted to throttle something without control rods, have instant response from the reactor, and then throttle back if you needed to to get your power. This reactor in the fluid uh, um, method was able to do that un unconven uh, unlike unconventional uh, or conventional reactors. Well, that program died pretty quickly as soon as the Air Force realized they could do the job much better with missiles. The um, missile program was, uh, uh, went full ahead, and, and that one was canceled. Um, the engineers still wouldn't give up, okay? They hunkered down in or, uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory in a small program, but they ran a small program from 65 to, to 1969. And the main thing I'll say about this, but I'm going to great details of the molten salt reactor experiment, was the fact that um, they ran it 24 hours a day, um, three shifts every day, but nobody wanted, none of the engineers wanted to stay for the weekend. So they shut it down on Friday night, and they started up regularly on Monday morning, something that's totally, you know, uh, not even thought about today in, in nuclear power plants. It is a base load. When it goes down, it goes down for a long time. You don't get to restart it. The end result today, most people think of molten salt as this gigantic reactor, uh, something very large. Uh, they even have some control rods that's so large. Um, single fluid, which means you're, you're uh, thorium is thrown in with your uranium in, in the reactor itself. Um, and you do, you do have a processing system. You have a freeze plug, which I'll show a little bit later. And you have this um, uh, Brayton um, closed cycle turbine system, unlike steam, that, that uh, is a, uh, um, an advantage to this idea. Well, if this was so good, the common question is, why wasn't it done? Well, hopefully I kind of hinted at that along the way. The establishment of the plutonium industry and, and uh, the needs there, um, the fact that this is a liquid system, it's daunting, it's, it's different than just nuclear uh, energy, it's a lot of chemistry involved. Uh, there's an existing mindset that had to be broken, and um, Dr. Weinberg, uh, who also owns the patents uh, for the reactors we have today, who helped um, basically train Admiral Rick over and suggested what the reactor for the Nautilus was, he was hoping that this reactor, which he worked on for a long time, would be the eventual uh, power reactor uh, technology that would use for electricity. Um, another person in his memoirs, um, uh, deputy director at Oak Ridge, also pointed out that it was an Oak Ridge project, and um, therefore it was considered just their own pet project, and it was very hard to break out of that mold. Again, the existing bureaucracy. Um, I've heard a lot of um, uh, talks on the um, uh, fusion as well, uh, the same kind of mindset where you're trying to break what the common um, large program has in, in the uh, government. All right, why is it so different? Liquid core, I mentioned that, the fact that it is thorium and that you have this chemical processing system. And you can see at room temperature, this is a crystal, it is a salt, um, and when you heat it up, it becomes a liquid, a little bit thicker than uh, water, you can pump it around. Last thing on the history, uh, at Rick over in his program, he managed to put together a gigantic organization to build uh, not only the Nautilus, but uh, the whole nuclear navy. And it stands today. Um, he's done a very good job as far as establishing safety record. The navy is excellent in that. But understand, it, inherently, it's not found in the reactor. It's found in the very strict rules, the blind obedience, the very well-trained, um, uh, long-trained long uh, process that you have to do with the uh, the sailors that uh, run these reactors. So here's the path that we've taken, the uh, typical nuclear reactor with this giant vessel. Um, and the question is, have we made the best decision then, or are we making the best decision now? And I'm going to then propose that lifter um, is something that is uh, uh, what fusion promises. Some technical details. Um, lifter is a technology or architecture of a technology, I should say. It's not a specific design, uh, but it has certain design characteristics. Two fluids, um, the fact that it's atmospheric pressure, very low pressure on the vessel. It's gonna be high temperature. Um, it's gonna have chemical extraction. I'll explain why that's necessary. Thermal spectrum, and then the, the closed cycle Brayton system instead of steam. 
Um, the reason why you have, this is the chart of the nucleides, the reason why we have to have extraction is that um, thorium with, uh, this is protons 90, um, absorbs a neutron, becomes thorium 233, which beta decays in 22 and a half minutes. Everybody know what beta decay uh, is. Uh, um, goes to protactinium. Protactinium, 27 days half-life. It also beta decays and becomes your fissile fuel, uranium-233. That's what you want to get in your reactor for your... Now, what if we leave the thorium, I mean, the, uh, the protactinium in the reactor? This is what happens. You get the same beginning. You get thorium beta decaying to protactinium. But now you have the problem of absorbing a second neutron, which is fairly highly likely, and seven and a half uh, hour, or seven hour, or uh, half-life, it will also de beta decay to uranium-234, which is not uh, fissile. Now, you could absorb yet another uh, neutron here and jump to 235, and with another neutron, split the 235. But obviously, that chain is using way too many neutrons, and the reactor would stop under, that, under those conditions. Um, and there's all these probabilities of, of how much absorption and there are other decay uh, methods that you have to take into account. So uh, that's the main reason why you want to take out the protactinium out of the reactor. So the architecture for uh, lifter um, starts out with the minimum core of uh, fissile material that's, that's hot. Um, the four corners just kind of remind you the, the basic premise, what are you trying to, the goals you're trying to get to, which is a safe, compact reactor, something that uh, proliferation resistance, um, waste reduction, um, covers that uh, uh, amount of electricity you need, that great big blue line, and do it quickly, um, as well as cost effective, being uh, effective uh, connecting to the grid. So um, the core is just hot. You can pump it in and out, drive the turbines, understand that. The blanket around it reflects the neutrons back in, or the thorium that's in the blanket absorbs and becomes your protactinium. You have to take out the protactinium. Here's the chemistry. And then let it decay, and then that produces the U233. And you can actually extract the uh, products, the fission products and other things, out of the reactor as it's running in this liquid state. Look at the inherent advantages. Again, systems engineering, everybody has desired goals. And you kind of specifically list, well, what are those goals where the cost? Well, it's a low fuel price, um, low capital costs, uh, long life, low maintenance, those kinds of things, transportation. You break those all down, and then you trace out what your inherent properties are to those. And you see whether they're, you, you're matching up or you're um, getting what you really want to. So if we um, pick a couple of these, uh, here's liquid core. You've got uh, homogeneous mixing, which means you don't have any hot spots, which is a real concern in conventional reactors. One spot gets hotter, and it continues to get hotter until you have a meltdown. Um, you get to burn up all the fuel, because it's constantly being moved around uh, in the reactor. And no fuel shutdowns, because you can fuel this continuously. Um, the expandability of the fluid uh, gives you a large negative temperature coefficient, which is where your safety is at. Um, no separate cooling system. That's one less system, and the big thing is the safety. The fact that if you're, there is no coolant to get rid of uh, in order to have a meltdown or, or a problem. And of course, drainable, and I'll give you an example of that. If you have this very small reactor core and you leave a tube out there, and this is very hot liquid, as long as you keep that at, at room temperature by blowing some air across it, or in this case, helium, forced helium tubes, um, that salt will freeze and it'll make a plug. Um, if you've got a crack in this thing, actually it will leak out and probably seal itself, okay, depending on how the design of this is. Um, but the point is, is if you lose power, if anything happens, somebody throw a grenade in this thing, uh, this, or if this gets hot, too hot for any reason, that plug will always melt and drain into a passive pan, which is going to hold the heat and, and the radiation. Um, if everything's okay, you just heat it back up or, or even turn it right back on, and it's liquid state. It takes a little while for that heat to dissipate, and you can pump it back in and start up. So instead of being like really cautious about shutting down your reactor because you'll black out half the uh, neighborhood or whatever and, and take days or, or months, if not years, to restart, you can go ahead and, and shut things down and go, oh, I, it was just a mistake, and immediately go back online. So actually there's inherent safety in there because you can use your safety system all the time. Uh, actually, I need to go back. All right. 
Uh, we'll pick thorium. Um, thorium advantages here that it was abundant. I mentioned that. Um, and um, the, f the fact that it's not fissile, okay, it means it's not weapons usefulness, in which case the less terrorist interest, again, goes to cost and safety, security, can't explode. Um, look at the uranium cycle compared to the thorium cycle. You start out with a whole lot more mining um, with the uh, uranium cycle. You have a whole lot of um, yellow cake uh, that you make. Everybody recognize that. But then you've got to enrich that and then make these pellets. It's a very expensive process. The security to do this process is very expensive, much less the actual process. You end up with a whole bunch of depleted uranium. It's still useful in some ways and, and not useful in others. So uh, I don't know what people are doing with that other than letting it sit on the ground. It doesn't go to Yucca Mountain. Um, you need a very big plant. You, as I saw before, you, uh, a very large reactor with a, um, a vessel that can hold up all the steam or any explosion that can happen here because it's very high pressure. A uh, big turbine plant next to it, and you produce a whole lot of spent fuel, and you need Yucca Mountain for 10,000 years. The uh, thorium cycle, you need one ton. This is for the same amount of energy, one gigawatt um, uh, for one year. Um, much smaller plant, uh, low, low pressure. Um, the Bratons are much smaller, much more efficient, uh, as much as 50% efficient or better, uh, compared to about 35% best you can do for um, steam. One ton of fission products, but the big deal here is that in, within 10 years, uh, most of that, 83%, is going to be back down to safe radio, uh, background levels, which means you can take those products, which actually were produced in the reactor. Uh, there's some very interesting things you can get out of that and you can sell some high quality uh, materials. And the remainder only needs 300 years approximately for storage, which you can imagine that the um, uh, finding in many places around the world that can handle that, and you can imagine making storage vessels that are. Uh, you know, caskets that can last 300 years. Well, proliferation risk, um, one of the things that happened with this particular process, with the litho process as, as we see it, um, there's going to be a little contamination of uranium-232. You just can't help it. I'll show you that in a minute. And uh, it has a uh, decay chain. It gets you down to thallium-208, which has a hard gamma emitter, which makes it very uh, nasty stuff to deal with. Uh, this is where the uranium gets in. Uh, the 232 becomes, there are certain reactions that can happen. Um, I don't have time to go through the details. Um, if you have 1% uh, of uranium-232 in the material um, and you're holding it, um, you have about uh, 30 or three minutes, I believe, a little less than three minutes before you get your full 5-rem dose, which is considered, you know, your, your top level. Uh, I think it's within a half an hour, no, within yeah, half an hour, you're uh, feeling the effects of radiation poisoning, and, a couple, and within two hours, you're uh, probably likely to die. So it's very hard to handle. Um, it also means separation. If a nation wanted to use this as material um, for weapons, it would be a hot uh, enrichment environment to deal with. Um, the radiation hurts the uh, electronics as well as the um, uh, uh, explosive material within the, the weapon, so they don't ship, they don't, they're, they're uh, long, uh, not very long half-life uh, as far as the, um, the shelf life of the, uh, of the, react, um, of the bombs. So. Okay. On the fluoride salt itself, um, ionic chemical stability is very important, um, and I'll show that in a minute. Um, the fact that it's very high temperature and low vapor pressure means you run very high temperatures. Um, and again, each one of these things, uh, room set temperature solid, like I explained before, leak resistance, et cetera. So look at the radiation damage in a con conventional um, nuclear, um, uh, <clears throat> nuclear reactor. It's going to have cladding. All the temperature and heat is built up within that cladding, and that cladding can't break. So, or you lose um, the uh, noble gases, the krypton, and other things that, which are radioactive. And so you end up having to pull out this, this core all the time and uh, not burn up all the fuel because there's physical damage being done to the solid. Whereas if it's ionically bonded in a liquid, the ionic bonds don't care. They're going to move around as they need to and reassemble. And um, you always have that uh, ability to, um, to withstand a lot of punishment in the reactor. Uh, another point of this is that um, the uh, Salts are actually very low corrosion, and the way to uh, briefly demonstrate that, here's a typical salt in the reactor. 
Um, and the, the larger the number, the better, minus uh, 104. And this is the uh, free, uh, free energy, Gibbs free energy here. Um, chemists will say you need a difference of, of 20 between it and, let's say, a wall material or a vessel material such as um, here's iron. Um, and you can see that's about double uh, the dif uh, difference between those two. So it's pretty chemically stable, uh, considered almost a noble uh, chemical reaction in the reactor. Internal processing, um, we have a minimal fizzle uh, inventory, so the reactor's small. Uh, there's no fuel fabrication. Obviously, that drives a lot of your cost. And a big thing is you can extract both poisons and valuable materials out of the reactor. This is a little more detail than the one I had before. What you're doing is you're pumping out of the core and you fluoride, just fluoride gas, um, through this salt. And all the um, uranium products are going to come out as... as uh, uranium hexafluoride, which means it's a gas, and you pull it out um, and reintroduce any of the uranium that's not burned into the reactor. Um, the rest of the salt goes through. You can back some distillation, get out the fission products. Um, and what's left here is you can separate this. And this would probably take uh, an economic analysis of how much time and effort would you do to separate these things. Do you do them at a, a central location plant where you take little bottles every once in a while out? and uh, centrally process, or do you incorporate it like you do um, the actual breeding process within the reactor itself? This is, would all be self-contained uh, in a reactor uh, vessel. Um, the blanket, on the other hand, comes out, and um, I like to think that is a, it's a reactive um, extraction column. If uh, the chemist, um, it's like a catalyst, but they say that's a bad word, so don't use it. And, well, to me, it's a, a catalyst in, in nature. Um, the fact that you put in the thorium up here and the thorium will go back into the blanket salt and replace the protactinium, which can be extracted out and put in a decayed tank. Um, same thing here. You just flow gas through that, fluorine gas. All the uranium that's produced, whenever it's produced, is uh, able to be put in back into the salt and back into the core. And very quickly on the closed cycle uh, Brayton, just to say that it could be air-cooled uh, heat rejection as well as um, uh, variable input pressure allows you to play with the size and the efficiency of the system. And this just shows, this is the advanced uh, boiling water reactor uh, typically looked at. And again, a very large building, no matter how you do these things. Um, the lifter concept would be uh, very much smaller. The whole reactor core would be something that size with the uh, entire Brayton system, uh, not much bigger. And it just, just shows, again, the uh, difference in size of a um, comparison of a um, uh, Brayton system versus steam plant and uh, some of the listing of, of reasons why you would think that the cost of this whole system um, would be a, a significantly less than existing uh, nuclear power plants. Okay. Well, the disadvantages, I think I explained some of these. It's unknown. It's going to be different from what the existing uh, infrastructure is going to support. Um, it does need a charge of uh, uranium-233 or some other fissile material. We suggest doing that because it keeps it, the whole reactor clean. Um, and here's a comparison. Um, basically, I've covered most of these, everything from the, the waste, uh, relative waste, 1 30th, uh, 10,000 years versus uh, 300 years, um, the fact that you can burn almost 100% versus 1% 1, 1 the best reactors are planning a, a couple of percent, maybe 2-3 um, of the total fuel usage, um, as well as being um, higher efficiency, lower pressure, uh, air or water cooled. And the unique applications, this should scale down as well as scale up if you want to make large plants, but it also could scale onto the back of a uh, semi-trailer, that size, typical. Uh, it would obviously be very advantage to the Navy because uh, even in their smaller vessels, they can't build these, their existing reactors uh, to fit into the uh, littoral um, ships that they have. We like to talk about uh, submerged units because they're really uh, not seen. You can put them in rivers, um, and they're very small, very invulnerable to attack or other things. And then uh, if you really want to use other processes, high temperature directly from the reactor is very useful 
for. Um, one is mobile. It can go to a site for air, uh, shale oil extraction. Um, it uh, couples very well with desalinization uh, for water processes, hydrogen uh, production as well because of the high temperature nature of the, uh, the reactor core. So hopefully I've covered a, um, the brief background. These are the main things that we try to uh, achieve with the technology. Uh, those are the driving goals and then how you actually put the reactor together so the specific details are driven by, by what you're trying to get out of it. And the, uh, the primary reason why uh, most people look at thorium is because of the unique nature of being able to produce a huge amount of uh, energy for a very small amount of resources uh, per megawatt being produced and can readily be uh, put together fairly quickly. So. Um, at this time, I'll, uh, I'll take questions. Yeah? The uh, Q233 that's re in the core, um, how do you keep the 232 out of it? I mean, it seems that you introduced 232, and it's something you don't want to go anywhere near. Um, all, uh, the, yeah, the, uh, um, what, what happens to the core when you introduce the 233 and the 232 in the, in the reactor core? Um, well, first of all, a reactor, any reactor, is very, very hot. You can't go near it. It's going to have a lot of radiation going on. So uh, adding the 232 uh, in there is not um, making any significant difference in, in the overall radioactivity in the core itself. Um, technically, it is a, uh, a small poison. It sits in there, but uh, um, it, it's very small trace amount. It's when you take it out that unless you separate it out, you always have a hot uranium. And the difference is the separation is chemical separation versus um, the uranium-233, which is what you want for the weapon, and uranium-232, uh, which produces this gamma all the time in its decay chain, um, has to be done with uh, separation techniques that are uh, more common to, to weapon development. Did I get the question right and, and answer? I was just wondering if, if it makes the design of the reactor more difficult because the 233 is actually part of the process. So um, you know, the materials you would use, for example, as part of the plumbing, would, would you run into problems if, if your plant becomes contaminated with some 232? No, because there's, um, again, the question I, it was, is there an issue with the uh, 233, 232 in the reactor core or as it comes out through the piping um, because of this radioactivity? Um, the decay products in the reactor um, overwhelm that. That's just one small source. Um, the reason why it's significant for proliferation issues is the fact that it's hard to separate because it's from the stuff you want uh, because it's still uranium chemically. Um, as far as the uh, reactor itself, any of the pumping, the pipes, and everything else is going to see some level of radioactivity just because of the decay products. Those decay products, what's nice about this reactor, are always kept at a minimum because you can take them out. Um, the gases, anything like krypton or whatever, uh, comes out in the pumping process. So. Um, uh, it's actually a cleaner reactor, if you want, um, inside the reactor and, and wears and tear radioactivity-wise uh, less. Yes? What's your uh, estimated cost for the consumer, say, uh, I don't know, wholesale price or retail price of the meter, and then um, what are the barriers to pursuing this? Um, what is the price at the meter uh, at the end of all this? Um, we haven't gotten that far in economic de development of what that would be. The argument here is that the technology and the research has been done, um, and there is a systems engineering point of view that you will say it will be uh, less expensive. Exactly, we're estimating 20 to, um, I think I said 30 to 50 percent less, um, a more specific design. Remember, everything's being done on everybody's own time. Uh, this is a grassroots effort that, uh, you know, we hope that somebody, whether the government or somebody else, wants to pick this up. Um, it's all free knowledge. But that's, that's a great question. Did I answer the other part of the question? Was cost of electricity and then? What, what are your barriers? So basically, resources, funding, what? Oh, what are the barriers to put this together? A um, couple of them. Uh, one of them would be that, uh, you know, the nuclear industry is run by the, by the government. You're going to have to get government blessing on something. Um, unless you leave the United States or whatever. Um, there are other countries that are looking into thorium, but again, um, not significantly. And um, so I think the barrier is, is uh, you know, those type of things. It is a nuclear process, and you're going to have to deal with the, the proper regulations uh, to meet that. Yeah. Um, I thought I saw the leader's slides that it's got a uh, negative thermal Can you explain that? 
Um, negative, uh, we need to, um, yeah, let me go back to the slide. Um, the, um, basically, it's, it's the ability of the reactor um, to respond in producing less power as the temperature goes up. So as the reactor core, a normal reactor, when the temperature goes up, okay, um, there's um, usually the, the core temperature, uh, what do you call it, is, is moderated with the water, um, and you get less power being produced. Okay? Maybe you flow more water through the reactor, uh, for example. Um, this expands itself. The core being liquid squeezes out. The less density you have, the less fuel you have in the reactor, therefore the less energy you can produce. So it's thermal, it's based on thermal expansion and how much fuel you actually have in the reactor. The same token, if your generators are producing more electricity because there's a higher demand, it sends back that fluid colder, which is denser, and therefore it will have more energy. And it is a natural process within the reactor itself. That's a common nuclear, uh, you know, I guess, uh, determination how safe a reactor is, is how how good that uh, coefficient is. Yes. What are the engineering challenges involved? Like it strikes me that you know pumping extremely hot in both senses of the word salt through pipes and pumps and such might be a really difficult thing to do. Could we build one of these very easily? The engineering challenges, I guess, is a question. Um, pumping hot salts through uh, pipes and and those kinds of things. Um, we do that on a regular basis in industry. Um, a lot of processes, a lot of industrial processes, use the same kind of hot salt uh, chemical uh, industry uses. So um, there's precedence. There's pump manufacturers that, that do that kind of thing. Uh, the temperatures are hot, but, but not you know, something that's uh, uh, not done every day in commercial industries. The, um, obviously, the safety requirements for everything, uh, you are talking about a nuclear reactor. It's going to have to be really good pumps, and, and the paperwork uh, is a mile high to make sure those pumps are, are uh, you know, adequate. But again, even if the pump failed, um, it, it doesn't, uh, you can drain the, the tank, and it will naturally get hot if the pump stops pumping. The core will get hot, overheat, pour out into your tray, and, uh, and stop it for you. So um, if the, there's nothing that inherently that industry can't do. It is a big systems engineering pro uh, problem um, to make one that's cost effective, that's safe and re meets all requirements, um, and that all the little details were taken care of. But uh, nothing that we've seen. Yes? So I've read that there's some kind of Gen 4 reactor development thing happening, I don't know, worldwide or something like this. There's like six different designs that they're pursuing, and this is one of them. But can you tell us a little bit about what that is? Like, to what extent does this get funded? Are the designs all being pursued with the same vigor? You know, what's going okay. on? Uh, the question being, what is a Gen 4, or how does that play in with this? Um, Gen 4 is a uh, Department of en Energy uh, initiative. Uh, it's probably a good one in some ways. They're looking for what's the next generation reactor. Um, technically, molten salt, not lifter, uh, which is slightly different, um, is under their, their category of Gen 4. Um, my personal take on it, when I look at the amount of money they're putting in, I'm not, I'm not sure they're very serious. I think it's in the realm of, uh, and don't quote me, but uh, $40,000, which is enough for one person to go out and, and write a paper and go to a conference. Uh, whereas the other projects are getting much more serious money. Um, you know, I'll let other people decide what the track record of Department of Energy is and, and you know, solving energy problems at this point. Cheers. Um, uh, so Kurt Sorensen's got his blog on the, the web and I do that. Uh, so that's one sort of nexus of work on this kind of thing. Uh, I suppose you know him? Yes, yes. Kurt Sorensen and I are, you know, th this is our... Lifter is, is that, and that thor, uh, thorium forum is uh, probably the key repository uh, in which people all get together and work on. France, and then there was Per Peterson up in Berkeley working on this stuff. And I um, what there are several people doing? that you're asking who else is, is working thorium? Per still working on this stuff, or did he like lose all his funding and go do something else? Um, I think he's. Kind of moved on to uh, to other things. He, he was Department of the Energy, I believe, um, and um, uh, so I don't I don't really know total status. Um, everybody's got their little um, ideas on how you use thorium, and some of them 
or just add thorium to a reactor, the existing reactor, and qual qualify that fuel. Now, qualification of a fuel for any reactor um, is a long, expensive process. And the question is, is if you're going to spend all that time and money and put it into the commercial reactors that are running fine and are safe, um, I would say maybe that's a little too much money, a little risk you're doing. Um, Trying to, trying to add it. But that's, that is a solution for thorium. Uh, thorium in a pebble bed is another one that people have talked about. Uh, it's a little bit better uh, than maybe uh, the conventional reactor. It, it's looking more and more like a liquid system. My point is I think you should go to liquid system and burn all the fuel uh, because in a pebble bed or these other concepts, you don't burn all the thorium and you still have a lot of waste that, that you have to get rid of. So, yes? Uh, design built through private funds, or is it something that you have to have government funding and involvement for? Uh, private or government funding? Um, well, that's up to individuals. Um, again, the organization, loose organization that I'm, I'm really representing or, or working with, um, doesn't have an answer to that. Um, it is. It would be daunting for private funding. It could be done private funding. Um, uh, certainly. Uh, the Navy would be a prime example of wanting something like this, yet the Navy has the same problem that Department of Energy does. They're kind of fixed in a certain pattern. It's very hard to break that. So um, if somebody wants to, to uh, take it to the next step, uh, which is maybe uh, demonstrating the chemistry without the, the nuclear material, um, a private company would have to have some backing from the government to say, yes, you can use uranium-233, which there's actually a lot of stored, and they want to blend it down and throw it away. That's, that's a sad way the uh, government is looking at this. Um, they haven't done it yet, but there are plans for it. So uh, if I was a private company or a private funds, the first thing I'd make sure is I had somebody in the government side saying, yes, we will hold that fuel, and yes, we will uh, let you uh, util utilize that. Because you need some kind of seed uh, fission material in order to start the process. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Oh, one more. Uh, so you're not currently pursuing any kind of uh, path to make it. I mean, you're obviously making it visible, but is there a concrete path of you know getting the government to go in on this and uh, get research? There, there are efforts. Uh, I guess your question is, is you know, what are the paths that we're pursuing or paths that could be pursued to get this going other than the education process that they were attempting to do right now? Um, yes, there is. Um, there's an uh, attempt to talk to uh, people both in the government. Um, when I was in the Naval Postgraduate School, the uh, students did a design project and uh, found that it was very interesting uh, uh, what it could do for the Navy as far as uh, capability in, in, in ships. Um, we need to do some more studies like that. I suspect that is going to come out. Um, I think in the next six months, because of all the energy um, research that's going to be done or analysis that's going to be done uh, to find out which way we want to go, uh, that thorium will be, and Lifter specifically, will be thrown in that mix. Uh, what comes out or who stands up and says, yes, let's do this or, or provides funds to do this, um, that remains to be seen. And, and I talk to other people you know, privately about uh, you know, what specific paths we've done um, you know, and share that information. Okay. No last minute question. One more. All right. I mean, it seems like if, if the problem is kind of a bureaucratic mind, you know, mindset roadblock, uh, going to the top and you know, Obama has said that he's not anti-nuclear. Go to the administration and say, you know, look, you need to consider this and, and make it, you know, make the oh. you know, we actually take it seriously. Yeah, going to the top uh, again. Not really a question, but a, a statement of of going to the top all the way. The the new administration and getting them to look at this and, and uh, you know, point uh, the agencies or, or money in that direction um, uh, certainly would, would help. I mean, that, that's the easy path if, if uh, we can do that. Um, people are working on those kinds of things. Um, like I said, I think it's a credible story, um, enough to uh, keep it in the mix, and enough to look at it seriously, and enough to seriously look at why is it not been promulgated to this point, what are those roadblocks, and is it just, uh, you know, the bureaucracy that we have? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. So. Okay. Thank you very much.